So if you've been present to these two days of conference, you're probably aware that uh, Professor Perboom hardly needs an introduction. He's been uh, quoted by most uh, speakers in these conferences, in this conference. Uh, so, but, well, Dirk Perboom is uh, the Susan Lynn Sage Professor of Philosophy and Ethics at Cornell University, and he's uh, outstanding research in, um, in free will and moral responsibility, uh, in philosophy of mind, about Kant, about philosophy of religion, are, have uh, marked uh, decisive uh, changes in, in all these literatures, and then for us, uh, decisive changes and uh, moves in the literature on free will. And so he has published in particular two very important books on uh, the problem of free will, namely uh, uh, Living Without Free Will in 2001, and his revised, uh, improved uh, views in uh, Free Will Agency and Meaning in Life, um, in 2014, and on, in philosophy of mind, uh, he has the, also the, the, the book in 2011, uh, Consciousness and the Prospects of Physicalism. So today he is going to present one of his uh, very important arguments against one version of uh, libertarianism, namely event causation. So the talk is entitled Event Causation, Luck and the Disappearing Agent Objection. Thanks very much. So this um, <clears throat> disappearing agent objection is kind of an is part of an in-house debate among among incompatibilists. So the question is, can you get a viable sort of incompatibilist theory of moral responsibility and basic desert moral responsibility in particular without agent causation? So the event causalist says yes. Um, um, we can. There is a coherent libertarian account of basic desert moral responsibility that countenances countenance only events as causes and down, it doesn't make reference to agents as causes. And this is taken by a lot of people to be a virtue because the thought is, contrary to what say, Tim was saying this morning, that uh, the event causal view is more scientifically respected than the substance causal view but that a lot of people, including Tim and Jonathan Lowe and, and um, Richard Swinburne, have called that view into question in recent years. Okay, so there's this uh, general worry about agent, about event causal views, uh, that they fall to uh, disappearing agent objection, and there are two sorts. There's one kind of disappearing agent objection that uh, targets the view that agency itself has an event causal account, and um, a number of authors, um, for, ex for example, Jennifer Hornsby has argued in a couple of papers in 2004 that, that agency itself requires agent causation and can't do with just event causation. Okay? So my, in, in my 2014 book, in this 2004 paper, my sights were set a little bit lower. The view is that you can't get basic desert moral responsibility on an event causal view. Um, although I'm going to address the more general objection to agency in this talk a little later on. Okay, so here's the basic setup. So we imagine we're, uh, that the event causal view is true, that there is indeterminism in event, the, event causal, the event causal network at just the right places, the kinds of places that libertarians would want the indeterminism to take place. Um, and here we have an agent who's in a deliberative context in which her motivations are in equipoise. So the agent has some prudential motivations, some moral motivations. It's like the Robert Kane case. Uh, Robert Kane imagines a case in which uh, the businesswoman is driving along the road. She, wants, she has reasons to get up, uh, to work on time because the boss is fairly punitive and if she's late, she gets punished in some way or another, but she there sees a stranded motorist. I guess in one case it was a stranded motorist, in the other case it's the assault victim, an assault, assault victim in an alley. So the question is whether to do the moral thing and stop and help the assault victim or do the prudential thing and speed on to work so that the boss doesn't get mad at you. Okay? So you've got motivations here that are in equipoise, you might imagine, that each renders the action that it supports about 50% probable. Okay, let's suppose there's just two possible actions here, speeding on to work or stopping and helping. 
OK, but we're in an event causal situation here in which, what? In which um, the, only causally relevant, the only causally relevant factors are events. And in this case, you might imagine, for simplicity's sake, that the events are belief events and desire events. And so you got um, the agent's desire to please her boss and her desire to, so her belief that speeding onto work will result in pleasing her boss. And you got the agent's desire to help people in trouble and her belief that if she stops, she'll help people in trouble. Okay. Now, um, okay, so construe these both as, of event, as events. The thing is that here we are at the time of decision, and the only causal input here are these, um, are these events, these belief events and desire events. Now we want to ask the following question with someone like Helen Stewart. Like what settles which way the decision goes? Right? Which, what settles which decision is made? And it doesn't seem to be that there's anything in the causal setup that settles which decision occurs. Huh? And you might think, well, like in this type of situation, I decide which decision occurs. But it seems that the event causalist only has recourse to these events, and that the, event, the events um, are in equipoise, so there's nothing about the events that um, can settle which way the decision occurs. So there seems to be something missing in the account of responsibility. Intuition is that if agents are morally responsible, in particular in the basic dessert sense, then the agent or something about the agent has to settle in this case which way the decision goes. But there isn't anything, so the event causal libertarian theory is in trouble. OK, so that's a kind of quick statement of the argument. There are a number of other arguments that have been raised against event causal libertarianism in the literature in the last while. One is the present luck objection, raised, for example, by Ishaji and Al Mili. Um, another one is the enhanced control objection, the idea that the event causal libertarian view doesn't provide control enhanced relative to causal determination. You know, Connor, uh, Tim O'Connor and Cl uh, Randy Clark and I have all raised that objection. And how these arguments are related is an interesting issue, and I may have a chance at the end to weigh in on that. OK, so um, this um, argument has, come, has been subjected to criticism in recent years on the part of uh, Randy Clark and Al Mealy and Laura Ekstrom. And uh, Al Mealy asks for clarification on what it is for an agent to settle which decision occurs or whether a decision occurs. He wonders whether we can, um, whether there's a coherent account as to what this means. And so the first thing I want to say is to settle which action to perform is to determine. Now, not, um, I don't want to pre prejudge the issue as to whether the determination has to be causal. After all, there are non causalists about settling around. We don't want to rule them out by definition. OK, so not necessarily causally. Which of one's options for action to perform? OK, now uh, Al has a specific question about settling which decision occurs as opposed to settling which action occurs. Um, and he himself has a nice account of this in his 1992 book. Typically, one settles whether one decides to A or decides not to A by determining whether or not to A or not A. Right? So here you are at the ice cream store, you decided between chocolate and strawberry. Um, how do you settle which decision occurs? The answer is, like, at least psychologically, you settle which um, ice cream to order, which flavor of ice cream to order. And so settling which ice cream to order also will settle which decision one makes. So Mealy says, in deciding to A, one settles upon A or upon trying to A, and one enters a state, a decision state, of being settled upon A or upon trying to A. Well, this isn't universally the case. Sometimes we're in deliberation focused on the decision as opposed to the action. This is, I think, unusual, and Al thinks it's unusual. So one might imagine a case in which the evangelist says, hmm, the time to decide has come. Will you decide to commit your life to Christ? And here the focus is on the decision, at least among certain evangelicals, as opposed to some sort of action. And in this case, you believe your eternal fate depends on your decision specifically. And you focus on whether to decide to commit your life to Christ. Okay? So here, the, the focus of your deliberation may, may be on the decision as opposed to some action. But that's an unusual sort of case. OK, so that's what settling amounts to. Now, um, let's consider a number of questions that have been 
raised about this argument. First of all, Randy Clark has what he calls the simple reply. And as we'll see, this is similar to a reply of Mark Balliger's uh, from 2014. So what, what Randy offers on behalf of the event causal libertarian, and he himself is not an event causal libertarian, so um, this is on behalf of, um, of a theory he doesn't endorse. He says, the making of the decision by S at T to A settles whether the decision is made then. Okay, very simple reply. It's just the making of the decision by S at T to A settles whether the decision is made then. So this is an event causal view because, look, the making of the decision by S at T to A, that's an event, right? And that settles whether the decision by S to A at T occurs. Pretty tight relation between the decision and the event, which he's happy with it. Okay, so um, now he puts it in terms of the making of the decision. Now on the face of it, the making relation is a causal relation. Okay? So the making of the decision by S at T to A, making is production. So at least on the, faces, on the face of it, this would seem to be, without further interpretation, this would seem to posit an event, sorry, an agent causal relation between an agent and a decision, which is not what we want, because after all, um, this reply is supposed to be a reply on behalf of the event causalist. And this suggests that we recast the making of the decision by S at T to A in event causal terms. So on the natural interpretation, the making of the decision by S amounts to the causing of the event S is deciding to A at T, and we have this event S is deciding to A at T, by S involving events, say desire E1 and belief E2, as in the Kane illustration. Uh, but given equipoise, there'll be other events, E3 and E4, poised to cause the alternative action event. S is deciding to not A at T. However, given event causal libertarianism, I'm just going to reiterate the disappearing agent objection at this point. Now there seems to be nothing left to settle whether S is deciding to A at T, by contrast with S is deciding to not A at T occurs, at least on the supposition that the settling role is causal and only events can play it. So only E1 and E2 and E3 and E4 are candidates for this role. But they, right, E1, 3, 4 don't settle which decision event occurs. Right? So we don't have a um, don't seem to have um, an event causal view um, uh, that counts as an interpretation of Clark's simple reply that can do the settling trick. Here's an alternative. The making of the decision by S at T to A might be interpreted non-causally. Right? So on the first option, S is making the decision to A amounts to a being the subject of relation between S and A plus, say, intrinsic intentionality. That's the Hume McCann view about uh, uh, the non-causal relation between agent and action in the case of a basic action, such as a decision. So this option might be considered on its own merits, but it seems at odds with the view that control in action is a causal matter, which is a typical commitment of event causal libertarianism. So I'm going to say that on the event causal view, um, you imagine it to be Davidsonian. The question is, what does control in action amount to? Well, the answer is, it's a causal matter. Right? And on this Hugh McCann view, or the Carl Genet view, it's not a causal matter in the case of basic action. On McCann's view, it's something like uh, the agents being the subject to the action, plus something like intrinsic intentionality, which is then interpreted in a non-causal way. OK. Um, but the view is supposed to be causal as opposed to non-causal, so let's leave that one aside. So on a second option, the making of the decision of S to A settles that the making of the decision of S to A occurs. But here the settling relation is the identity relation, which is again non-causal. And it dawns with the view that the controlling action is a causal matter. And so what Randy actually said is that, well, it's not identity, it's con something like constitution. But constitution is also a non-causal relation. So there again, settling is non-causal. OK. Um, and look, there's a general worry here. I think that sometimes when the event causalists like Mark Balliger is pressed, that they kind of slip into kind of a non-causal language. So for example, Mark Balliger in his 2010 book tries to answer one version of the luck objection, which is Peter Van Inwagen's rollback objection. 
It doesn't matter what the details are. But then the question is, like, who settles? Like, how does the settling of the decision occur? And in his example, the relevant agent is Ralph. And he says, it's Ralph who does the choosing. It's Ralph who does the choosing. And this is supposed to be an event causal account. OK. So, um, and then I argue against him in my 2014 book, as I argued against Randy, that, look, if this is interpreted event causally, then we don't have an answer to the disappearing agent objection. But more recently, he proposes that uh, a response to the disappearing agent objection that features a combination of event causal and non-causal relations. He's, this is what I meant all along. Right? It's supposed to be an event causal plus non-causal uh, view. Okay, so he says, um, in the scenario, the event that settles which option is chosen is the conscious decision, i.e., the event with a me consciously choosing now phenomenology. Okay, um, first, you know, if we're going to reinterpret this in event causal terms again, the disappearing agent objection arises all over again. But I think there's a worry about the non causal view more generally. I mean, so there's a general question about whether this really counts as an event causal view. But um, let's leave that aside for a second. So one problem with non-causal views generally is one that I develop in my 2014 book, and it developed in particular against um, my colleague Carl Genet's conception of uh, the um, of non-causalism. So one thing that Genet says is that in the case of a basic basic action, even though the relation between agent and action is non-causal, it's still the case that the agent makes the action happen and makes the difference as to when it'll happen. At this point, I say, well, making happen, that's a causal relation, right? That's just what causation is, making happen. So how can it be the case that the relation between the agent and the basic action is non-causal and the agent makes it happen, given that causation is just making happen? Yeah? And he also wants to say that the agent makes a difference as to whether it'll happen. And difference making is at least a causal notion, right? Especially if you're, if you're um, David Lewis. Okay, so the problem there is that non-causalists seem kind of driven to causal talk once they kind of specify the details of the theory. Also, this is true of Stuart Getz's view. He claims it's a non-causal view, but then starts using causal language to explicate the position. Now, the only kind of resolute non-causalism that I know of, which I think is a very cool theory, is developed by um, <coughs> Henri Bergson, who was you know, appointed as professor by the Collège de France in the year 1900, so it's appropriate we discuss him. Right? So, so what he says, and maybe he's the, maybe he's the originator of all non-causal views. Is that a plausible historical thesis? But anyway, here's how it goes. So his view is, look, all this theorizing that we do about the self, it's not really all that great. We're driven to it, but it can't really get it right because our, the, the best sort of epistemic relation we have to consciousness and freedom is intuitive and not theoretical. So what you intuit about the self is the way it really is. Now, we're all driven to theory, especially if we have academic positions. But the only way to theorize about free will and consciousness is to use concepts from the natural sciences. So as soon as we start theorizing, we use causal concepts to um, explicate the way we think the self works. Okay? But this has to be resisted. Okay? These, theoretical, right, these theoretical intrusions onto our view of the self and free will all involve error. Okay? So the way it really is where itself really is, is discernible only to intuition, non-theoretical intuition. Okay, so if you're Bergson, you wouldn't try to explicate the non-causal relation the way that Genet tries to, in terms of making happen and difference making. Hmm? Okay, you might just use words that uh, aren't taken from the physical science, like you say, agents decide. Um, um, maybe even you'd use the word control, but you wouldn't use the causal concepts derived from the physical sciences. Okay? Anyway, um, so maybe that's one to make non-causalism work. But non-causalism isn't a, that sort of non-causalism isn't a vindication of event causal libertarianism, a very different sort of view with different aims. 
Wait, some other questions about the physician. So Clark also asks whether the notion of settling can have the role in determining whether an event causal libertarian theory can secure moral responsibility, given the rejection of robust alternatives, uh, the robust alternatives requirement for moral responsibility motivated by successful Frankfurt examples. Okay, so I'm on Frankfurt's side in this debate, um, Carolina's as well, so let me give you her uh, Frankfurt case, because I also think that um, her account, her account of difference making in the case of action provides an account of settling, a compatibilist account of settling, um, and this compatibilist account of settling stands in contrast to what Helen Stewart argues. So Helen Stewart also argues that the notion of settling is central to um, theory of moral responsibility, but she thinks that settling is necessarily an indeterministic concept. Okay? So you can't settle unless indeterminism is true on her view. At least you can't settle in the sense required for um, moral responsibility. Okay, so um, here's Carolina's Frank and Furt example. Again, Frank has reasons to harm Furt and makes the choice to shoot him, moved by those reasons. Unbeknownst to Frank, a neuroscientist has been secretly monitoring his brain processes. Had the neuroscientist had any reason to believe that Frank wasn't going to make the choice to shoot Furt on his own, the neuroscientist is a reliable predictor of those things. He would have intervened by manipulating Frank's brain in a way that Frank would still have made the same choice. Um, so it's not the case that Frank's reasons, reasons make the difference as to whether he will choose to shoot Furt in the sense that the choice counterfactually depends on this cause in a simple way, says Carolina. But in general, effects don't in a simple way counterfactually depend on their causes. So she argues that causes do make a difference to their effects and that the effects wouldn't have been caused by the absence of their causes. And we saw this account in Cyril's presentation earlier this afternoon. So the reasons for which Frank makes his choice uh, make a difference to the choice because even if the same choice would still have occurred in their absence, the choice wouldn't have been caused by their absence. Something else, she explains, would have caused the choice, in this case, the neuroscientist. Following this lead and adapting these conditions to the notion of settling, we can propose um, so an agent settles whether an action occurs only if it is caused by certain reasons of hers where the absence of those reasons would not have caused that action. And you can adapt this to different theories, for example, agent causation, which is where we're headed. Let's say an agent settles whether an action occurs only if the agent causes it for certain reasons where the absence of her agent causing the action for those reasons would not have caused that action. And uh, as Carolina was explaining yesterday, if one is averse to absence causation, one might instead evoke Pildow's quasi-causation, where the absence of watering the plant quasi-causes it to die, just in case watering it would have caused it to continue to live. OK, so let's um, think about the disappearing agent objection against action. So Al, Mealy, and Laura Ekstrom, Randy Clark, and most recently Chris Franklin asked whether the disappearing agent objection against um, the possibility of event causalism securing basic dessert responsibility generalizes to um, an objection against event causal theories of action, whether deterministic or indeterministic. So Mueller remarks that given my rejection of agent causal libertarianism, I'd be left without action, which is bad. Right? So my view wouldn't have um, be left without an account of action. He uh, charges. Okay, so it um, turns out that I'm open to the claim that the argument does generalize. I'm not sure about this, but um, anyway, I'm like open to it. And, and there's an article I uh, published in 2015 which spells out this argument, and here's the summary. Okay, so you begin with David Bellman's problem for action. Okay, so he's worried about whether you can have an account of action put solely in, in event causal terms. Um, and so you might wonder whether there's a disappearing agent in the case of action generally. So here again, you might think of a case in which you've got uh, motivations that are in equipoise, an event causal theory is true. Now, one question you can ask is the agent, can the agent be basic dessert morally responsible? Another question you can ask is whether the agent acts at all, as opposed to the um, the decision simply occurring without the agent being uh, 
without the agent acting. Okay, so Velleman's proposal is that the role of the agent uh, is, to play, is to have the role of the agent be played by an event, okay, an event which is a desire event, and that desire is a desire to act in accord with the reasons. Now, there's a worry here as well. In the case of the torn decision, it's not a desire to act in accord with the reasons isn't going to be uh, apt for settling which of the two options occurs because the reasons are equal in strength. Okay? You might even imagine that they're equal in normative strength and that this is something that the agent understands. Okay, so a desire to act in accordance with the reasons wouldn't seem to do the trick in a case like that. So Laura Ekstrom, another event causalist, um, in her view, uh, like Bellamans, the functional role of the agent is played by certain events. In her, cases, it, in her case, it's general preference events. Okay, so in her view, a decision for which an agent's morally responsible must result by a normal causal process from an undefeated authorized general preference, where such preferences are non-coercively formed or maintained and are caused but not causally determined by considerations brought to bear in his deliberation. So you might imagine there's an undefeated authorized general preference to do the right thing, okay? to do the right thing. Okay, so you can, here you can object again in a way that is similar to how we objected to Velleman's account. So we can suppose that in our equipoise situation, these authorized general preferences are in motivational equipoise. Okay? So you might imagine that an agent has authorized general preferences for morality and for self-interest that are in equipoise. Okay? They weigh equally for that agent. Okay? And, um, so in the kinds of situations we're imagining, it's not as if these general preferences can settle which way the decision goes. Okay, so um, now at this point, am I, left without, am I left without an account of action? Well, one way to go, there are a number of different possibilities here. One might be to argue that on the determinist event causal model, these problems don't arise. But maybe they still do. So Dan and Elkin, for example, does think that they arise on, on the determinist event causal model. So at this point, one might, like Ned Markosian and Dan and Elkin, appeal to deterministic agent causation. So you could have agent causation on a deterministic model. And of course, we see this in the history of philosophy. Um, maybe a really good case is Leibniz. Right? Leibniz is clearly not an event causalist. He's a substance causalist, agent causalist, but also very much a determinist. So in his view, we have deterministic agent causation. Spinoza is probably also a deterministic agent causalist. Okay? So we have a couple of people who, um, who hold this view in the history of philosophy. So um, why not? And so you might imagine that it's agent, it's agent causes that um, settle on this view which decision has occurred, but maybe in ways that are not totally evident to the agent on all occasions, these agents are nonetheless causally determined to settle as they do. So that's a possible account. Okay, so uh, Al Mealy raises another charge. He says, look, um, on the event causal libertarian view, and I see this kind of, and Laura Ekstrom actually makes the same kind of, makes the same kind of, uh, raises the same kind of worry in her 2016 article. So it remains correct to say that agents and not events decide and make decisions. Okay? So Laura says it, it's not as if, so on, um, here's Al's example. So he imagines this guy Sam, he says Sam has and exercises the ability or power to sink free throws, and he sinks many of them. His intentions, beliefs, skills, um, and the like do not sink free throws, alone or in combination with one another. And that is no surprise, because they're not able to sink free throws. Okay, you wanna say, so even if you're event causalist, you're gonna say, Sam sunk the free throw. It's a basketball thing, okay? Um, and you're not gonna say Al's intentions, beliefs, skills, and the like sink, sunk the free throw. Okay? This is how we talk. Okay, that's yeah, fine, this is how we talk, but event causal libertarianism has a certain kind of metaphysical commitment, okay? So it's committed to a broadly causal theory of action and to the claim that all causes of our actions are actions or events. Um, so this position is committed to the thesis that all causal influences on action are most fundamentally event causal and thus explicable in exclusively event causal terms. 
So one thing that Al can't mean is that uh, when, it, when we say that, when we say correctly that Sam sunk the free throw, that Sam is a causal influence distinct from Sam's, from Sam involving events and states. Now it's going to sound odd to say that a collection of events or states sinks the free throw and we don't talk this way and event causalists don't recommend linguistic revision. But the event causal libertarian must affirm, is committed to, the view that what grounds the truth of the claim, Sam, Sam sunk the free throw, is that a collection of events, a number of them Sam involving, caused a further event. The ball's going through the hoop. Okay? So there's that. That's the truth maker. The truth maker is event causal and not agent causal. Okay? So what's at issue here isn't how we're used to speaking, but the metaphysical commitments of an event causal theory of action. Okay, so um, one thing I want to say is that the disappearing agent objection targets, and I hope successfully, the semantic position according to which claims such as Sam sunk the free throw are true, but the causal relations that make them true are solely event causal relations. Okay? So another kind of view that I think is successfully targeted by the objection is kind of the reductionist view that all substance causal relations reduce to event causal relations. Okay? So if that's your view, the disappearing art agent argument targets you as well. But there's another view a non-reductive physicalist view that's not targeted by the, I shouldn't say it's not targeted by the objection. I don't claim that it's targeted by this objection. Okay. And uh, so you might think that there is such a thing as substance causation at the agent level, okay. and it's libertarian substance causation. So we have agent causation here, and so we wheel in agent causation to solve the disappearing agent objection. But um, the all agent causal relations, despite the fact that they're substance causal, are grounded in event causal relations. So at lower levels, you get only event causation. At the higher level, you get substance causation. So I don't know of anything that rules that out. That's a possibility, as long as there's a non-reductive relation between the substance causation level and the event causation level. Now, it may be better, may be better to opt for the view that Tim was arguing for this morning if you're a non-reductive physicalist to think that, yeah, uh, if you're going to go for deterministic agent causation or libertarian agent causation uh, and you want to ground this in lower levels, it's best to be a substance causalist all the way down. Okay? But I don't, see a, in, I don't see a clear objection to the view that the kind of the constituting, the lower level constitution might consist just in event causation. Um, so finally, I was going to say something about how these other objections, the present luck objection and the uh, enhanced control objection are related to the disappearing agent objection. So, you know, the present luck objection is this, that if you take Keynes, businesswoman, um, right, you've got these events, E1 and E2, and E3 and E4 that occur, and then she makes the, then the decision to speed on to work, say, occurs. Uh, so Mealy says it seems to be a matter of luck because there's nothing in the preceding events that fixes what's going to occur at the level of decision. Hmm? Um, now, Mealy does think that luck is consistent with free will. He has no argument against the view that luck is consistent with free will, although Haji thinks that it's not. Okay? So what's the relation between that argument, maybe as Haji sees it, and the disappearing agent objection? Well, maybe it's just this, that the disappearing agent objection is kind of like the present luck objection but with an eye toward what would answer the present luck objection, namely the um, reappearance of the agent. So that's one way to think about it dialectically. Then we have the enhanced control view, enhanced control objection, which is this. Look, if you take a deterministic situation, you, um, you don't have enough, you're an incompatibilist, you think that there's insufficient control for basic desert moral responsibility. Um, and so the question is, what would enhance that what would enhance that control so that you would get this sort of responsibility. And the disappearing agent objection, again, may point to a solution that at least you need the agent as cause. Not only the agent as cause, but also um, indeterminism. So uh, at least it's attractive to think that what would provide the enhanced control is agent causation plus indeterminism. Um, thanks. Thank you very much.